Hello friends, this is Self Critical Automaton and it's time to start chapter 5 of Bayonetta. This is episode 10 or 11 maybe. I really should keep track of that, but I'm not going to, so there. I'm going to jump right in in a second, but first I want to point out that I am in the middle of a big old uh, coronavirus related post viral syndrome flare up, so I feel like I've been hit by a truck. I have got the bad flu, so I am. I might be a little floaty, I might be a little uh, little out of it, but hopefully I should be able to still be good at, at this thing that I do. So let's go. Where the hell am I? I'd better have got frequent flyer miles for that flight. So yeah, it looks like Fortitudo just yeets her halfway across France, but um, I really like the design of this level visually, but I also think it is very ridiculous and unrealistic in a way that I don't particularly like for this game. Um, let's just read this first. Crescent and Sunrise Valleys. As overseers of history, the Lumen Sages and Umbra Witches were both incredibly powerful, each fearing each other and prohibiting interrelations as a way to maintain the balance of power. Upon the annual occasion of a total solar eclipse, only the selected elders of each clan were allowed to meet with the other group to conduct negotiations. Just as an aside, I want to point out that solar eclipses are very rare and not annual in real life. I suppose that each clan, drawing their power from the sun and the moon respectively, must have held the eclipse as the most special of celestial phenomena. The two clans, inexorably linked but opposed, like positive and negative, solidified this relationship in their interconnected mountain highways, the Witch's Sanctuary of Crescent Valley and the Sage's Sacred Sunrise Valley. Oh my god, that's a lot of sibilance in one sentence. Located in an inaccessible and treacherous region, these areas were lined with countless rows of stone monuments dedicated to each clan's dead, and large statues depicting a witch and sage stood at the centre of the shared area, demarcating the border between each clan's territory. Each statue has its back turned to the other, and their visages, as though rejecting any human intrusion, stir intense feelings of discomfort within one's soul. Atop these statues, the clans met for their yearly consort, giving this place a mysterious but interesting ambiance. These valleys were not just filled with memorial tombs, they were also home to training facilities in the light and dark arts, held as sacred ground by both clans. Today the statue of the Umbra Witch is a truly gruesome sight, as a giant spear has pierced the woman's chest. If it was shoved through the statue during Witch's Age of Persecution, it would have required unspeakable power from the Lumen Sage who carried out the act. So, a lot of assumptions here again. Can we assume that it was a Lumen Sage who did it, or perhaps it was some kind of other otherworldly entity? Also, if they're standing back to back, doesn't that imply an allegiance, rather than some kind of oppositional disposition between the two of them? Perhaps in ancient times they were in fact um, you know, two sides of the same coin. They didn't necessarily hate each other, they were just four different things in different places. But again, it seems that they did live right next to each other. This is quite a boring, quick combat. This is just, it's just these cheruby guys. I mean, they're not what cherubs are, but what are they called? Deer or decorations? You can, in fact, do this entire combat just by standing still and holding the shoot button, which is kind of funny. It's the easiest pure platinum in the game. So, yeah, design-wise, I was talking about this space. I don't like it because I don't like, for this kind of setting, for this kind of game, roads floating in space. There's plenty of games where roads floating in space are an appropriate level uh, basis, but it feels less grounded. This is a very ungrounded game to begin with. I'm just going to talk over this cutscene because it's just introducing new guys that I hate. I can't stand these guys, they're one of my least favourite enemies out of all the ones I've encountered so far. Um, I think they're also the first properly elemental enemies. The blue one has electric element and the, one, the, the red one has fire element, as you might guess. So once again, this game pulls off its trick of immediately ending a cutscene with something for you to dodge which I find infuriating. Um, 
But yeah, so... I don't know to what extent the elemental um, logic is present in this game. I don't know... Are fire enemies weak to something later that I will have, you know, a water or ice element attack? Or are they just on fire? Okay, wow. Also, they do an absolute shitload of damage, as you can see. That one combo took off, what, a quarter of my hit points? So, I... I might end up using a few items as we go through this level. But um, not only are they uh, really irritating to fight, because a lot of their attacks are very fast and very wide, and do a huge amount of damage, I also can't stand the weapon that they drop. Although I do like that its animation keeps running. They've just got those wiggly wiggly fingers. So before we go on, we're going to head back, because backtracking is what this game is built out of, apparently. Um, but yeah, so as you can see, the aesthetic is very much just large roads floating in space. And as much as I like giant objects floating in space in certain circumstances, I just believe it less. One of the remarkable things about this game is that everything that happens in it is completely ludicrous, and yet somehow I find myself believing the, you know, the ludicrous things. It's just part of the parameters of this world, but this is kind of a mismatch. It looks like something out of a Zelda game rather than something, you know, as gaudy and feminine as Bayonetta. So I'm going to uh, leave off right here and hand off to future me. Uh, thanks, past me. So this is yet another one of the... Um, I say yet another, I think it's only the second one. But this one really kind of rams home how... Well, how frustrating some of these challenges can be, because you are completely at the mercy of the AI's decisions. It forces you to, um, you know, as I was saying about some of the previous challenges, to recontextualize your abilities, learn how they work in a greater sense. So, for example, you might notice that I usually attack from the side or behind. That's because if you attack from the front in which time, uh, you knock them flying. This is pretty useful in general fights, but in these specific challenges, it means that a bunch of your attacks are liable to miss, or you need to jump to follow after them, you know, and so it just wastes some of your precious seconds. But the main irritation is simply that because you can only hurt them while you're in which time, you just wait around for them to do the right attack. So, yeah, um, it's especially irritating with the applauds because they can fly and they just float up in the air and, you know... You kind of wait for them to do something that you can dodge, but then they just stand there and they do that floor attack, which is undodgeable, or they, you know, switch weapons, or they fly around and do nothing. It also helps you notice that uh, there's actually an interesting um, component of the way the AI is programmed. When you're fighting these fights, it generally feels like you're under attack from all sides simultaneously. It feels like you're going to be, you know, completely surrounded and destroyed. It feels like you're you're dodging attacks and parrying attacks from every angle simultaneously, like uh, some kind of high adrenaline genius kung fu warrior. But if you pay attention, which um, bonus challenges like this tend to force you to, because you are just standing around waiting for them to do something that you can counter attack or dodge, uh, you will see that they actually uh, never attack at the same time. You're never attacked by uh, enemies that are off-screen, so enemies behind you or enemies to one to the side. It's either never or extremely rare that their AI decides to attack. You're only attacked by people you can see. So this helps uh, make sure that it's fair while also feeling like you're, you know, in a fraught life and death struggle. Which is just a really clever little thing. It's a lot like uh, rubber banding in racing games, which is where... Um, cars that fall too far behind or are too far ahead are brought forwards or backwards so that you always feel like you're in a tight struggle for for uh, for supremacy whereas it you know without that you can just be completely outclassed and be driving by yourself or you know completely outclass the AI and be miles ahead and not have any challenge because even if you ram right into something they'll catch up with you or they won't catch up with you rather so yeah, that's, this is where we start to see how the challenge rooms really, you know, help you learn more about the way the AI is programmed and more about the way that the various different mechanics of the combat can be used and, and abused. 
so yeah that's probably going to be all from me here in the future and in a moment i'll be handing back to me in the past and i'm back so i managed that one on the first try which i'm pretty pleased with even though i did only get a gold medal but that's still pretty good for this one um the combat challenges start getting hard but fair i would call it because there's kind of a kind of an intention in the game that you're supposed to, you know, play through it mul multiple times and come back to previous sections. So that's why, um, for example, with the jumping challenge rooms, you're kind of expected to come back to those after you have the Kasheldra whip because, well, they make it it makes it significantly easier, which we do have and we will use later. But yeah, so um, I, oh oh no oh for fuck's sake. Fortunately, I wasn't at low enough health that that just uh, insta-killed me, but, um, yeah, I am not firing all cylinders today, but I didn't want to leave it too much longer, because I don't want to run out my buffer this soon. I do have a buffer of so Oh, I've gone the wrong way. Okay. Well, um, I guess you can tell from that how I'm feeling. I guess this does give me time to talk about something I've been trying to talk about for ages and keep forgetting, which is Bayonetta's visual design. So, there's several major influences on her visual design. Um, notably, her physique was designed when the game's character designer saw uh, fashion illustrations and these curious, lengthy, leggy characters used for um, fashion design illustration, which um, you may or may not know. It tends to have very elongated legs uh, and, um, and so on. There's a very particular aesthetic that is the uh, fashion design house aesthetic used for those particular illustrations. So her physique is based around that, um, combined with, uh, to quote the director, his favourite shape of woman, which, you know, is curious given that she is just a cricket, um, as I will not stop saying. I love, th I love the blunt shotgunning that these guys get when you use the, uh, the trumpet. So, can I? Oh, interesting. Most of the angel weapons don't actually consume if you don't hit an, an enemy with them, or a... Uh, yeah. But it looks like the ranged one does. Time for a cutscene. Huh. My lipstick. Absolutely no guile, this woman. Put something shiny under a box propped up with a stick and she'd fall for it. I mean, he did get photographs of a floating lipstick. girl without lipstick but lipstick without a girl most curious isn't it Cheshire what's also most curious is how a child like you has kept afloat in this town the name is Luca and don't you think it's a little strange to be worried about my well-being sure the festival of resurrection has peaked security the thing only happens once every 500 years can you blame them Besides, when you look as good as I do, security isn't a problem. But a killer like you, on the other hand, I'm sure you found a way. That little girl. I've seen her somewhere. Don't go freaking out on me. We both know you came here for something. But what you don't know is the closer you get, the harder it's going to be for you to get away from me and what you've done. You'll have to fess up to it all. <laughs> I can't wait for you to get your hands on whatever it is you're after. Let me guess. You want a cut? Well, if you're still alive by then, perhaps you can appeal to my... Generosity. Still alive? You may be standing right in front of me, but you're definitely not living in reality. Which is a shame. Because the truth is always going to be the truth. All I see when I look at you, the real you, is the truth. The truth is, you killed my father. I don't care who believes me. They can't reject the truth. The truth will set me free from your black stain on my life. The truth 
will allow me to expose you to the world. Then, I'll have won. And I'll do it without stooping to your level. Because I'm not a heartless witch like you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you gonna do? Kill me in plain sight? There's nobody here, Luca. Go ahead. It would only prove everything I've said about you. Well, that and sadden the hearts of a number of young ladies. Claire and Trish and Sylvia and Amy. Oh, you don't want to piss her off, let me tell you. Hell hath no fury. Gotta love the heteronormative sight gags. I think they say something about the director that I will get to eventually. What the? So yeah, uh, that's the end of that cutscene, I guess. I thought there was a little bit more to it, but perhaps I am wrong. Yep. So once again, this game indulging in its fun, fun, you know, favorite activity of ending a cutscene with something you have to dodge. So you might notice that these guys, uh, the upgraded second type of these guys, I really love the kind of pharaonic look it has. I know that it's uh, like design is actually based around um, some more Christian uh, you know like church treasures? What's the word for those? There, there is a word for them but I can't remember what it is. Um, but the kind of blue and gold together just feels vaguely, vaguely pharaonic to me and um, I think that's a cool aesthetic. The, uh, the crests on their heads definitely contributes to that as well. Let's see if I can get through this without dying like an idiot. Oh boy. Um, so what was I saying? Oh yeah, these guys also appear to have an elemental effect, but I don't know to what extent that that actually is used. I, um, I do know that if you equip... There's an elemental weapon we'll get shortly, and um, I do know that if you equip that to your feet then you aren't harmed by the respective element while running across it, but I don't know to what other extent. Is it just a kind of a gating thing so that enemies that are on fire you can only punch if you use a fire weapon? That kind of thing? Who knows? Probably someone. Anyway, oh, more guys. This is another new enemy type. Uh, these ones do friendly fire, which is very amusing to me. So... Yeah, as you can see, they are the upgraded form of the trumpet guys, and instead of, you know, orbs, they shoot enormous big lasers, which I think we can all empathise with. Alright, time to go over here, but I won't actually fight these guys. As soon as you set foot on that, they start to fall, and um, it's not really... you don't have time to fight them, so you just wait for them to die. Uh, which is grim, really. Let's go and grab this, and I did. Fantastic. So, this is another one of these big ancient mechanisms which does ridiculous things, you know, because the power level in this game is absolutely absurd. But first we're going to read this. Heavenly Manipulators. The Umbra Witch's sacred Crescent Valley is said to contain enormous relics harking back to the valley's place as a training ground in the witch's supernatural magic arts. The long bridge that snakes between the cavernous ravines of the valley, stone circles hinting at celestial principles, training chambers where death was wagered in the hope of polishing one's skills in life. All of these are depicted in the tattered records I have obtained. I know not if they ever truly existed, however, the magnificent appearance of the witch statue in the distance it seems to indicate that the legends passed down through history are in fact real. Amongst these numerous artifacts, the most mysterious are those known as heavenly manipulators. I've already described how the Umbra Witches drew their power from the darkness and the Lumen Sages from the light. However, I have not mentioned how these powers were at their greatest during full moon or at the peak of the sun's ascent. The two groups created the Heavenly Manipulators to affect the movement of this moon and sun, and these devices played a role in the clan's most important of ceremonial rites. 
If stories are to be believed, the clans could affect even the ways of the cosmos at will. The powers of the witch and sage were not common knowledge, although, as overseers of history, one could imagine that they must have had appropriately powerful abilities, making their ultimate destruction an even more ironic end. So yeah, that guy seems to be saying that... Well, first off, he seems to be saying that the sages were strongest at midday, which makes sense, and the witches were strongest at full moon, which makes sense, but a full moon happens once a month. Uh, you know, the sun is... it's midday once a day. So that kind of reflects either a power differential between them or another one of the many, many differences between this world and our world. It's ostensibly supposed to be our world, but the game has zero interest in representing that or really interfacing with that con with that concept, you know? It's fun that these characters in this fantasy world can say things like Jesus or the devil and have that mean something, but what does that mean when you consider that, you know... Like, did Jesus exist? Was he a Lumen Sage? What What does that actually... What are the implications here? That's what I'm wondering. Um, also, I did have several questions raised by that cutscene, namely... How did Luca get here? Like, we got yeeted by, as far as I can tell, an actual god, halfway across a country, and... You know, it took, what, a few hours? And he's just here, in the middle of nowhere, on a floating path in the middle of nowhere. So... I know that he does his Spider-Man thing, but oh, let's see if I can hit this just for funsies. Pow. Yes. And we're going to have to fight another couple of these guys, which is a pain in the ass. but what can we do about it? Nothing whatsoever. So if I'm lucky, I'll do enough damage in the first like couple combos that I can just do this and finish one of them off. Because, as I said before, this game is all about divide and conquer. If you want to, you know, be good at dodging, it's a lot easier to dodge three guys. Sorry, it's a lot easier to dodge one guy than it is three guys. So if you can take one down instantaneously, you should. Which is why it's always good to smash objects in between fights, because uh, if you get a good decent magic drop, you can fill up your magic meter, and then that will let you, of course, get away with absolute murder, since you can just immediately start out by doing um, that one combo and then a torture attack to finish them off. So... Not a great combo score on this one, but that's acceptable, I guess. Now, I should have saved that uh, that uh, torture attack to use against the next combat because I want to show something off, but hopefully there will be an opportunity next episode to do that. Or possibly even later this episode, depending on how fast I go. But there should be uh, just immediately straight into another combat? Yeah, there we go. So these enemies are incredibly irritating, and they are one of the weirder angel designs. As you can see, they are influenced by... Um, insects and sea creatures in terms of design but they're just a huge <sighs> once again attacking me straight out of a cutscene you'd think i'd be used to it by now but yeah they fly and the targeting in this game with regards to hitting stuff that's in the air is pretty bad um so if i can build up enough magic to get a torture attack on one of these guys i will if i can't you'll have to wait until the next episode to see the cool thing that they do As it is, I'm struggling with them. I wonder if the Kasheldra whip is to my advantage here. Perhaps I can... Oh, I don't have it equipped. I should probably do that. Uh, yeah, that should be everything. Because as you can see, you can use it to yank things around. Stomp on the bug. This is what you're supposed to do. Okay. So the Kasheldra whip does actually have a really big... Uh, attack range for a melee weapon, but its combos are slow, its animations are long, and it doesn't do very much damage, it doesn't give you very many combo points. As you can see, I only got bronze in that one. So that's kind of why I don't like to use the whip for anything other than like the very specific tasks it's very good at. Um, how many, oh, okay, there we go. How many hits does it take to get to the center of one of these things? So I'm going to see if I can smash some rocks for stuff, because I'm a bit low on health. With a bit of luck, one of these will drop a big healing item. Because the healing items that you get from broken objects don't count as against your item total for your score at the end of a level. Um, these spirit things are just an environmental danger. If they touch you, you take damage. Um, there's not really much more to say about them. But I was talking about Bayonetta's visual design, so... Oh, fantastic. A uh, big magic healy thingy, but I did actually want, you know, healing healy. So I'll grab this and then hopefully I'll remember to talk about the rest of her design.
I've only been trying to for, what, eight episodes now? The Witch's Tears of Blood. Beginning in the 15th century, the whole of Europe has been swept by a madness, a tragic event unprecedented in human history, the witch hunts. Just as an aside, I do have to point out that there have been a lot of genocides in human history. It's hardly unprecedented. As a result, the dark clan of Umbra witches were wiped from the pages of history forever. Working at the behest of the powers that be, and making use of ancient magical arts, the witches watched over the passage of time within the human world. Or at least they did, until suddenly being swept up in waves of persecution, and finally crumbling away under the pressure of the people's harsh recriminations. The women's sorrowful, blood-stained tears crystallised into bright red gemstones, and according to Vigridian legend, are said to be scattered everywhere. These stones, filled with feelings of regret, are known as the Umbran Tears of Blood. To this day, the people of Vigrid believe that should 100 of these stones be brought together as one, enormous calamity will befall the land. Yet no one has actually seen one of these gemstones, the ultimate of witchly souvenirs. They must be found for you by a crow, a beast whose heart lies in resonance with the departed witches. These crows act as the witches' loyal servants, protecting their tears from falling into human hands. And from my hands, given how they dodge. Uh, also, it looks like... yeah, I think I missed one of these. That's a shame. Oh well. Eventually I'd like to go through the uh, hierarchy of Laguna and the uh, infernal demons as well, but I don't have time right now. So... oh, okay. Right. One of the problems with Shiraba is that it's very directed and it's quite easy to miss misalign things, but the damage it does makes up for it. So let's dip into the gates of hell. Now, I was talking about... oh, hang on. He'll say some hilarious games reference, won't he? Hang on. Let's go. Take care of my babies, will you? Some people may have a thing for the 45s, but to me, these are the real works of art. So, of course, we've heard that one before. I was talking about her visual design, yes. So, do we have a treasure to grab? We bought that one already, there aren't any more yet. I actually am going to grab a health upgrade here, just because uh, grabbing a health upgrade also restores a little bit of health, I assume equal to the amount that your health bar increases by, but that's all I want to get right now. So, yeah, the other major influences on her design are, of course, the dominatrix, which, you know, thematically uh, presents kind of untouchable and fierce, angry, threatening femininity, and... Um, you know, that's definitely an intentional, um, you know, influence or uh, reference in terms of character design. She's supposed to be untouchable. She's supposed to be incredibly powerful. So, um, yeah. And there's many, many kind of dominatrixy influences in this game. Also, this is the easiest puzzle in the world. I would assume it was there to teach you that you can do damage by dropping from a high height, except for the fact that that hasn't been relevant at all yet. And as far as I know, it doesn't become relevant. So I think that's going to be the end of this episode. I'm just going to finish my thought, namely by introducing the, the, or at least I'm going to finish introducing the idea of her character design being interesting and relevant, with the third thing being camp. She is incredibly camp and her um, visual design and general attitude are heavily influenced by drag, you know, the tradition of, um, of drag, well, drag queens specifically rather than drag kings, but this is interesting and relevant for reasons that I will talk about later, hopefully, if I remember to, which I will because it's in my notes, because I'm a professional. Anyway, that's going to be all from me for today. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and there's links to my other projects in the description. Thank you so much for watching.